So, um, I, I work with Anna at, at, at MIT. Um, as, um, as Joyce said, our, what we're really interested in is exactly what you guys are doing out here. Um, we've always been interested in how do you get more people to make stuff. Um, it originally started um, probably because when we, uh, when we were hired at MIT, one of the first things I had to do was teach. And then in doing that, and I, I had never taught a class in my life, except maybe Sunday school when I was a little kid. And um, it was one of those moments where you had to generate tools. That's the only way I, I, I figured I could teach these other students that were much smarter than me. Um, and so it began this, this, this real interest in, in how can you democratize uh, medical device design and fabrication. Um, and so I'll give you a sense of how we do things and what we're up to these days. Um, some of you know about our work from, from other uh, meetings, but think about when, when you look at a bicycle. And when you look at a bicycle, uh, when, it's, when you see somebody ride it, um, it's, it's all there. You immediately grasp how it works. You understand how everything is connected, what powers it, what drives it. Um, and it's that sense of transparent design that invites modification. And you add training wheels to it, you add lights. People in Cuba add motors, um, babies, flowers. <laughs> and and it's, 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 it's what really gave us that, that same design sensibility, I think, not far from here. Um, gave us gave us the right flyer. You know, the rights were bicycle designers. And when you look at the right flyer, again, it's like it's all there. You understand the ailerons. You understand the st how how they how they mastered um, flight control and stability in in, in Kitty Hawk. It, it was it was something that because it was transparent, even though ironically they had a patent and they fought it for years, but they fought many 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 competitors. That, that ultimately gave us the aerospace industry that we have today. And it, if you look at the history of flying, it went, it, it was almost like it's more the Moore's Law of its day. It went very, very quickly. We went from this to you know, the early versions of what we would recognize as Cessnas um, within, within not two decades, probably. When we look at medical devices, whether they're engineered here in Michigan or if my place of work, sadly, they're not, they're anything but transparent. They're definitely black boxes. We don't understand them. They're definitely engineered so that we don't understand them. That the industrial design is literally housed in, in, in things that are not inviting for us to understand in the same way that we understand cooking and biking and a bunch of, and sports equipment um, and pretty much everything else we buy for ourselves. Um, so when most people look at a typical pulse oximeter, we, we do a lot of teardowns. I know some of you probably do a lot of teardowns. But we don't tear down the iPhone 6, because I can only buy one every two years. I haven't <laughs> bought that one. Um, but I can buy things like this pulse oximeter for 30 bucks. And we tear it down, and I look at it, and we, you know, very few people understand, some of you may recognize, that you know, the heart of it all is like two components. And that's what gives us that differential of, of, of um, IR and, 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 and regular light is what, it was, it's what gives that sensor that oxygenation ratio, right? When somebody wants to find out if they're going to have a baby or not, one of the first things that I see, I always go to the aisle at CVS and I, and I just, you know, I look at people in that aisle and, and it, they instinctively go for the $20 digital test. You know, the expensive one that's going to give us a better result and few people Few people really recognize that, that that is all fine and well, and it's going to tell you, hey, yes, it's, it's coming, whatever. At the end of the day, it's only two components out of those 35 that really do the magic. Those are the most important parts of that test, and you can get those two components for like a dollar on Amazon. You, we buy them by the hundreds for, 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 for less than 50 bucks. Um, so so we, we need to come back. To, to transparent design and health. And I don't mean open source necessarily. Um, you know, you, you could buy a bike and it may not it may have a design, but you understand it. I, I'm not, I think that as, as much as we like for everybody to make their own devices, we fully are aware that maybe not every poor mom's not gonna make her own uh, blue copter. But it'd be great if she understood it, if she understands why she can't put the generic strips in her, you know, Bluetooth enabled Bayer one. 
Um, and, then, and it leads to better conversations between the provider, between the engineers that make it, between the insurance that pay for it. When we don't understand it, one of the things that I've been observing recently um, is what we can learn from farmers. And we don't really have a lot of farmers in Massachusetts, but we have a lot of farms that look like this in, 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 in Michigan. And the, far, the farm tractor on the left is from 1970. And I don't know if you guys have been following this, but um, in 1970, that tractor was entirely analog. Maybe, may, I guess, no, we didn't even have digital clocks back then, okay? And that farmer could weld stuff onto it. They could replace the spark plugs. They could replace the belts. They could replace, they could hack the timing. Um, that they could, they could, I mean, it was almost, the stereotypical image of a farmer working on your tractor, the Hollywood thing. You know, if you think of some of the first images in Superman, I think that's what they were doing. They were working on the tractor, right? Um, when they were, they, I think some of them did not see Superman, but <laughs> <laughs> but I saw Superman. And and um, and when you compare the, the tractor on the right, even though they're both green, that tractor now has computer-controlled valve timing. It has computer control, you know, engine, um, I don't know a bunch of our cars, but, but all the, the engine and the, and the way it burns fuel and the way it knows when it's connected to an accessory, all of these things are now computer controlled. And, and because we have this law um, called the DMCA, the Jill Cover Millennium Act, that, it, that, that, that basically manufacturers, uh, you know, to, to put it simply, lease the tractor to us, lease the, the, the software of the tractor to us, um, even though we technically bought it, we don't have full control over that tractor. And that leads to expensive repairs, that leads to, a, to really a, uh, leaving the farmers, in, in the case of, of tractors, completely disenfranchised from what they would do, from what they grew up doing most of their life. Um, and it diminishes our power as users. So consider, you know, what now, now what, what would happen with, with, with medical devices? This is exactly what's, what's starting to happen, or has already happened. It's, for years it's been happening, with, for instance, with glucometers. Um, it's when, well, glucometers probably were one of those, like, the first ones that, that sort of insidiously uh, did this. Um, now, I don't know much about tractors, that's why, I, but I do know a lot about coffee. Um, I grew up drinking coffee, as Emily knows, since I was five years old. <laughs> a little bit of milk, but it was great. Um, and, and this is how I make coffee every day. It's a fully analog experience, and it is fantastic. I get to select the best beans, I get to take my time, um, and it's comp I, I know exactly how the whole thing works. I may not know exactly the chemical composition of the fibers in the paper or the filter, but if I really wanted to know, I could find out, okay? Um, what's happening now? As most of you know, who work in offices, we now have DMCA in coffee cups. This is an espresso pot, and, and it, has a, it has a little barcode now. And the barcode is not there for you to check it out at the, at, at the supermarket. It's, it's actually red, just like a printer cartridge in a, in a, in a printer. And now we have this ubiquitous, horrendous thing that not even that doesn't even give us good coffee. And and if you, I dare you to go back to your uh, to your workplaces on, on uh, tomorrow, and and demand better coffee. Those of you who have the courage, and see what type of answers you get. And it's it's just one of those things where or or say, could we get fresh Colombian beans that we can grind? And then you, society in a way has evolved. We we. we it, it's almost like if, if you were to bring that thing over to work, it would just, even though it produces a better, a better cup of coffee, it would just be, it, you, you would get an earful from, from the office of the manager. Now, I'm trying not to be glib, obviously, about coffee, but, but the reality is, again, this is how slowly these things slip into our mainstream, and I think it's really been happening in healthcare technology for a long time. It's, we used to have the Wright brothers back in the day. Um, we used to have uh, makers of health that, that would change uh, the history of medicine, like you know, people like John Haitian Gibbons that made the heart-lung machine and then gave away the blueprints to other doctors so that they could replicate it. 
And yes, they had to scale, and eventually it became a company. Um, but at that beginning moment, we, we, would, we would have that sharing. We still have it in other areas of medicine, like surgical procedures. You can't patent those, and you, can't, it, it, you have to publish them. The other reason that black box design is dangerous for medicine is that then it leads to situations like what we experienced last week, if some of you have kept up with the news. I'm not going to say any names because it's easy to Google, but there was a company, a darling of Silicon Valley, that basically said, this is going to change diagnostics like you never believed it before. They were on the TEDs, they were on all the magazines, okay. But it was all a secret. It was our black box and you just have to trust us because we are revolutionizing things. And the people that kind of knew, you know, the old school lab techs, you would see, I actually would go to other forums to see what they were seeing, you know, what they were working with. Like people at LabQuest and all that, sure, they were their competitors, but it was this, you know, slow grumblings of people saying, this, this, there's got to be something behind it. But once these things gain momentum, it's very, very hard to stop them until they fall flat on their face, which is what happened last week. The, um, the, the third element that I want to bring up um, that I think black box is, is, is hurting us in a sense is what I call the digital divide in health. Um, thanks to Joyce, I, uh, from a tweet, I learned a lot. If, if you don't follow Joyce Lee, doctor, <laughs> as a designer, on Twitter, I'm sure all of you do, right? Maybe that's why you got an invitation, I'm not sure. But, but if you want another invitation next year, follow her. Um, because one of the things I learned, she, I get amazing stuff from, from her, and one of these was this little video. And this video is that the evolution of the desktop. Many, many of you have seen this, and it's great, right? Because that means that this was a desktop back in when we, everybody was a little kid. Um, and then as digital technology evolved, we slowly ended up with just a bunch of apps that now we don't have to pay for, you know, say a globe or a Rolodex or a, or a notebook to do word processing. It's, it's just been all amplified and it's just wonderful uh, free technology. I, I, um, the, the, the example I like to think about is, is yeah, I, I like Instagram. And if you think about it, Instagram, for, you're using this tiny little crappy resolution uh, camera, but Instagram has done more to democratize photography than any 30 megapixel Hasselblad medium format camera um, that, you know, uh, or Leica that, that, that professional photographers would drool over. And you have millions of people taking wonderful pictures and, and, and really uh, enjoying their creativity. So, it, so this is all great. Okay, I think we can all agree. Does anybody not like the situation? I, I, I think it's made my life easier. The smartphone and the digitization of, of the offices. Now let's consider what happens in this scenario when we open our medicine cabinet. We go, when, and what happens when we introduce smartphone hardware to the current state of, of affairs? We go from a $2 digital thermometer that we can buy at Walgreens or CVS or any other pharmacy to a $29 one that happens to graph something. And by the way, we then donate that data to that company. We go from a $13, yet digital, not even manual, digital um, blood pressure cuff to a almost, you know, $170 one that connects again to your iPhone. It's cool, but you know, think about somebody making minimum wage with a family to support. What, how, do they, how do they justify joining where, call it the digital health or the tracker or the enlightened uh, technology movement of health when, when maybe um, the insurance is not going to cover that? We go from pacifiers. I actually, this pacifier on the left, the $7 one, was one of the first things I bought. I still remember it when I got a budget from MIT to like, um, um, e equip my lab. Now I can buy the smartphone one for 40 bucks, and then my favorite one to knock and warn people about that I think makers should completely obliterate is how do we eliminate these really stupid $300 pill bottles that supposedly create the internet of adherence? Because my grandmother is only on six medications at least, plus the vitamins. And I don't think we want to live in a world where we have to convince Susanna's bosses that we have to spend $2,000 in gadgets for, for our parents to, 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 to be adherent to their medication. When in fact we all know here that that 
probably cost me twenty ten dollars to make if you do if you, if you know what you're doing. So that, that doesn't mean that my grandmother's going to go out and solder stuff and make her own. My grand I grant you that. But in the same way that if I offered her two hundred dollar a liter orange juice whenever she gets a cold, she would she would probably yell at me and say, no, just go get me my regular orange juice from, from Tropicana that costs two dollars. Because she understands the value add of whatever it is that, that I would be selling. She would understand that she doesn't have to pay a hundred uh, hundred and ninety-eight dollars more just because, you know, it's a smartphone app that tells you how much orange juice you drink. Um, I think we can do better so that we stop seeing headlines like this. And I think Makers have been here before. Makers has, I mentioned this last year, Makers gave us balloon angioplasty. Andreas Brunsvig literally hacked this on his kitchen table. You know, Daniela Urbina in Nicaragua hacked this stethoscope because she didn't have, had no other way of doing it. Um, and when we look at things like diagnostics, um, one of the things that we've been working on recently, and we're publishing this soon, so I, I would appreciate not treating this, um, is we, we, some of you have seen our Ampli blocks. How do we democratize so that we never get another company that says, oh yeah, we have this magic black box. So what we've, what we've done is created essentially Legos um, for diagnostics. And we call them Ampli. Essentially, they're, they're little plug and play modules that have a library of different ligands and antibodies and, and, and aptamers. Basically, things that like biomarkers that you can then detect. Um, but, but the idea is, I, I don't want to work on a single diagnostic. I get really distracted really fast, asked our students. Um, so my job is, how can I just enable a bunch of people to make whatever they want to make? And this is how you just, you, you connect it. You just, within about a minute, you can um, assemble them, and then essentially you get a little signal that tells you, in this case, you're negative, because you didn't get two lines, you just got one line. Um, and then you can do other things, like this, for instance, is, is um, testing three different types of cancer biomarkers and then using the bottom channel to make sure that one of them is not giving you a false positive. Um, this one is for clinical chemistry to test if you've taken tuberculosis drugs. Um, and then people can start to assemble their own things but based on the designs that they want. For us, it's like our little contribution to try to be sort of like the Arduino of biology, if you will. One of the things that happened last year is everybody saw the news and we were getting Ebola everywhere. It was like Hollywood's worst nightmare. People were getting sick in the waiting rooms trying to find out if they had Ebola. Um, and we actually had a grant from the NIH uh, that was aimed at detection of dengue. Um, and one of the things that we could detect with, our, with, our, with some of our gadgets was, was Ebola. And while we were sitting on the paper trying to like finishing it up and, and, and send it off, we saw one of the largest deployments of black boxes. It was a massive airlift of black boxes to West Africa that both Canada, the U.S., and Europe sent. You know, it was almost a billion dollars in aid. And I participated in some of those meetings, and it was a little bit bewildering because people really were not really evaluating these technologies to, to, and understanding them. One company got like a $247 million contract. Nobody knows if they helped a single patient. And so we made one of these um, Ampli things for, 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 uh, for Ebola. We knew what we could do it. We had some, we, and then we, 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 we actually were able to publish our multiplex diagnostics. So this thing is not an Ampli, it's a more traditional test, but it has like multiple lanes so you can detect multiple things and it can detect Ebola and yellow fever and, and uh, dengue um, and a bunch of other things. And we published it because that's what we do as academics and there's our lab on a chip, um, and then it would, like, tip for you. If you publish with, in, during an epidemic, it is amazing to your social media scores. <laughs> so, like, um, none of, nobody in my lab knew what Altmetric was, but I knew, because I'd met the founder. And it, we had, like, if you read the, 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 the little subtitle here, you know, basically, we blew their score through the roof. And for, for like, I know little about this, um, you know, what you guys do over here in this, but for us, it felt like this. <laughs> like, you know, we were, it, we were high-fiving. Um, <laughs> but we were not helping anybody. You know, the reality is we had a paper, we had a little test, it was fun, it, it stroked our egos a little bit, 
and we called. We called the WHO. We called our friends at the London School of Tropical Medicine. We called MSF. We called everybody in our network that we knew was connected to the. We called the CDC. We. I went. I was summoned by the White House in Washington to go to a hackathon, and I said, "I have a test. What can I? Oh, this is great." And. And it was, it was one of those things where we just were getting a bunch of walls and we realized, okay, this is, this is what happens when you're not part of the club. Not necessarily the Washington Club, that's a whole different thing. I'm really talking about, in this case, the Global Health Club in Geneva. And uh, I'll spare you the politics, but we, we, we then sat down with our really conservative Harvard collaborators and said, okay, we need to do something drastic. And so that we can at least get this out there, and, and, and how do we, and, and we convinced each other to basically take that existing test and make it a kit, which is something we had experience in doing. So that we can ship these kits to West Africa, and it's a West African scientist, we're going to run into those patients much, much faster and closer than I will. I've never been to West Africa. I probably will never go to West Africa at this stage, but we can send these things out there. They can be the inventors of their own solutions. We can give them a little nudge. And, the, and, and that led us to continue that type of, 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 of philosophy. We made a class at MIT um, where we were interested in patient-generated data. How can, we, how can we democratize more of this data? Uh, we, hear, we hear a lot about this in the tractor conferences, in the Contrified Self conferences, in the Basically, anything that says digital health is about patient-generated data, and we were really interested in how can more patients really get control of their own data, given that, frankly, they're, they're the ones producing it. And our approach was, use that as a model, but instead of giving me a black box, give me a kit. And so these are our students making different types of kits and then analyzing this data. And then the, the construction kit enables other people to replicate it instead of yet producing another MIT-designed black box. So this is a little kit, for instance, for uh, little kids that have these types of arthrosis that if they don't fit very well, they fall. They don't want to tell their mom because that means a trip to the hospital and so this cycle of, of bad therapy. So we, it's just a tiny accelerometer, but then they get to trick it out with the different types of badges. Um, and then we can detect when that, whether it's, if, if we fall or not. Uh, one day I walked into a lab and this little Japanese undergrad that we had just was all of a sudden just falling, and I thought there was something wrong with him, and what he was doing was basically calibrating the accelerometer. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a test for using, uh, uh, measuring a type of glucose using a gas reaction. Um, and one of the hardest things, and I'll leave you with, with this, I'm, I'm almost done, one of the hardest things for our students was not the technology. It was not the analysis of the data. It was not the algorithms. They're, they're pretty good. Um, it was that we were not optimizing the design. You know, for years, for four years in some cases or more, they had been taught from day one that you take those specs and then you boil them down into something that, that ultimately gives you a final design. And when you make a kit, you can't do that. You have to anticipate that your user is going to modify it. And you have to have faith in your user that they're going to modify, that you are not the only game in town with an engineering uh, skill set. They have a maker skill set, and they will use it. And, and that's what is, is this notion for us of, of, of design for hack. How can we ultimately make these designs so that they're purposely intended, so that somebody else can hack and make them um, and remake them? And you know, that's how we get the next right. So I'll leave you for that.